morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Annette Dale Pereira, and I've got the pleasure in chairing this very important seminar on opioid substitution treatment, or OST, literacy and rights. Uh, so we're going to spend the next hour and a half with you. Um, we've got a great uh, lineup uh, for you. Um, we've got an overview of the project coming from um, uh, Christos Anastasio, and I always get that wrong, and I'm so sorry, so I'm going to no, call no, no Christos A. Christos A will give a fabulous overview of the project. We're then going to hear how the project is unfolding in three countries uh, in Europe, and then we'll have some reflections on the project um, from Dr. Christos K. Um, we'll then have time for questions and answers. And if anybody's got any questions all the way through this, please do use the chat function. We will be monitoring it and then we'll bring in their questions through there. A um, uh, little bit about intro uh, for myself. Uh, so I've been working for many years in uh, substance uh, use treatment uh, in the UK. And then in the last five years, I've been working mainly internationally, mainly for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and the World Health Organization, uh, primarily on helping to try and improve the quality of treatment for uh, drug use uh, and drug use dependency, drug use problems. Now, there's some really interesting things, I think, happening at an international level. So for the first time, we've got some great international guidelines that have been agreed by all 192 member states. They're not perfect because they're a consensus document agreed by 192 different countries, but they do stress the importance of have everybody having access to high quality treatment that needs it. And within that, they stress the importance of having good quality pharmacological treatment, including opioid substitution treatment, sometimes called opioid medication assisted treatment, i.e. methadone, buprenorphine, maintenance, etc. And the international guidelines stress the importance of every system in every country, country having access uh, to, these, to this very, very important medication. So not so good news is that um, the coverage of drug treatment around the world is still quite poor. Uh, the global average is one in eight. Uh, sadly, in many countries, it's less, especially in places like Africa. It's nearer to one in 18. In Europe, we are luckier. We do have, as a region, the highest coverage of drug treatment of anywhere in the world. But we've still got a way to go. And we know that the quality of many types of drug treatment isn't good enough. And sometimes we don't have evidence-based practice. We haven't got a good enough dose. Uh, some uh, services don't uphold human rights and some do not offer the key modalities and interventions. Um, I was working last month in Pakistan and in the whole of the country, they still do not have access to uh, OST. Uh, and they're looking at how to do that. Um, so uh, we're doing better in Europe than many parts of the world. Um, but there's still work to do. Now, empowering people who use opioids, increasing awareness of evidence-based OST treatment, and educating people on what they should expect as a human right, and in terms of the medication and support they should get, is critical to ensuring the quality of treatment. So I fully support this initiative. It's an excellent project. So let's hear more about it. So I'm going to hand over to our first speak to speaker, Christos A. I'd be very, very uh, delighted if you would um, tell us about the project and give us an overview. You have the floor. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, I want to welcome all to, to our first uh, webinar uh, from this series. Uh, I, will, I want to wish you all uh, a nice month and that today is a uh, uh, April Fool's Day, and be careful, don't get fooled. And um, I'm starting to to describe the project. Uh, the, the OST Literacy and Rights project is based in a collaboration between Europol, uh, 
a donor of pharmaceutical company called Camerus and the three pilot countries, Germany, Sweden, and United Kingdom. The project is managed by me, Christos Anastasi from Pirnaps, Greece. One of the key elements of the project was the development of an OST client guide called OST, we are in this together. This is a guide about treatment of opioid dependency from people who have lived it. The OST client guide consists a technical briefing on opioid dependency, OST medication, and the process of OST assessment, treatment initiation, dispensing, supervision, and review. It also includes studies of in meaningful participation in client center care. The, code, the document further includes a troubleshooting section that helps address key problems that many that may arise uh, in the delivering an OST care plan. The OST client guide uh, was written by Matt Saswell in consultation uh, with the wider project team. The Eurobood resource uh, was strongly influenced and uh, drew by a sister resource written by Bill Nace, another Canadian priest from British Columbia. The project is being <clears throat> piloted in three uh, national settings. With this project, Eurobood should so how to empower people with opioid dependency to raise their knowledge about the treatment system, treatment options, and the rights of the people in drug treatment. This support peace to talk in an informed and educated way when advocating for their rights. The OST project also includes country consultation with peer and professional stakeholders in three pilot countries. The purpose of consultation is uh, for partners to review the good practice standards uh, described in, te in the technical guide and compare them with the current practice in the national context. Consultations are also a platform for discussion about opportunities to strengthen, to strengthen OST services and increase meaningful participa participation of people with opioid dependency. Pilot countries are in different stages with regard uh, to this part of the project, uh, which corresponds with a specific country context. Germany has already completed the consultation, whereas uh, UK and Sweden we could contact this year. The OST, uh, the OST uh, client guide has allowed Europe an opportunity to work with key stakeholders in national OST system who can use the resource within their quality management system. The guide has been a critical resource in process and demonstrated a key lesson that by putting technical resources in the hands of the country drug user group, those groups can then advocate and work towards a change uh, at a national level. Also, the literacy rights project has proven to be a great success in due to the and due to the continued 2021. Talks are currently at the way about translating uh, OST leaflet in the other countries, Nor Norwegia, Greece, and, uh, and uh, elsewhere. Um, why uh, Europe hopes to pursue an OST project also in other uh, European states. Also, we are starting from today. This is the first uh, webinar series. Uh, about uh, uh, about the, the, the peers and the, the we call it peer works and uh, I want you to welcome uh, for the it's our first webinar thank you very much that's it for me uh, Christos thank you very very much for that excellent overview of the document. Um, We've got a few uh, a few um, comments and questions coming through, uh, but that was a great overview. Thank you. Um, somebody asked whether a recording of the seminar will be available, and the answer is yes. We will share. Um, we are sharing the guide, the the guidance document itself. Um, OST. We are in it together. You can see it here. It's shared in the chat. That's great. Um, uh, a question uh, for you, uh, Christos, from Lynn Jeffries. 
She said, what was the BC guide called? She missed that in your talk. Can you answer that? Uh, what, what was? The BC guide called. I'm guessing BC is British Columbia. Yeah. Oh, British yeah, Columbia. yeah, yeah, the British Columbia. Okay, uh, it's by Bill Nails, uh, and uh, the name is, it's, uh, uh, I think, method on uh, something. Uh, wait, uh, I've shared it in. I've shared it in the uh, link. It's called yes. the OAT Handbook. Is, is what it's called, and, and we've shared it in the link as well. Thank you. Yeah. That, that, we've got a collective response from you on that one by our dear friend Bill Mellis. Uh, so thank you for that question, Lynn. That's excellent. Um, so uh, great stuff. We've got some more things coming through. Yes, great material. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christos. So you've got some good uh, comments coming through. Somebody said, this is a fantastic resource. Is it okay for me to share on Twitter? Or is it yes, being fully course. launched? That's from Joe Schofield is saying that. So good responses to this already. So excellent, excellent. Thank you all. Thank you very, very much, Christos. Um, now, I think it would be really interesting to go and hear some of the experiences uh, of the rollout for some countries. So the first person that I would like to invite uh, to speak on this is uh, Dick Sch Dirk Schaefer who will talk about uh, rollout in Germany. Dirk, would you yeah. like to take the floor? Yes, I will start. Um, can you give my camera, um, uh, Roberto? Uh, Roberto, stop my camera. Ah, okay. Now it works. And uh, we can Hello. see it now. Yes. Hello, guys. Um, uh, thanks a lot for being here today. Um, and we were very excited when we were invited to be one of the uh, countries um, to um, uh, implement um, this new project and um, this new leaflet. Because um, uh, in my view, um, in the beginning, I thought it is not that easy to have um, treatment guidelines um, for uh, different European countries because uh, many of us um, had different structures for OST treatment, different um, regulations, also different medications. So um, I was very excited if um, uh, this works. And um, what we did then is that, um, as Christos told you, um, uh, Matt was very helpful to set up uh, the, the frame of the, the project and um, a first version. And with this first version, I, um, I pr presented that um, at the National Addiction Conference in November in Berlin. Um, um, we, there were a few hundred doctors and also staff um, from psychosocial uh, psycho, uh, care and from other disciplines, and um, uh, we discussed that on uh, on that level. And um, after this, um, I brought it to um, the uh, the Jazz Network. I'm working with. We have 20 local groups in Germany. You all know that. Uh, all of them uh, called Jess, junkies, uh, ex-user, and people in opiate substitution treatment. And um, uh, they made um, very important changes in, in the paper for Germany, because um, as I told you, um, that we have different structures and also different medications. And uh, what my colleague said was uh, that um, it made no sense to to speak about um, medications um, um, we didn't have in Germany because no one knows that it makes no sense. So we have the same um, basis, um, um, uh, the basis brochure, the same text, but we have some special things for the countries inside. So, you know, we have this levomethadone in Germany, we put it inside and um, and so um, um, 
After this, um, we discussed that with the doctors and uh, with people who use drugs in our network, it come to the next step um, that it um, go to the printer. And um, now we, we copied 1000 uh, um, uh, issues of that and um, distributed that to um, different um, doctors in different regions, but also to drug service organizations who are responsible for psychosocial care. Um, and that is the, the, the very important uh, thing of this new project, that it is usable for all kinds of disciplines who are working in OST treatment. It is in the first line for us as people who use drugs, uh, who are working in, in advocacy or in other topics, that um, we can um, show what are the international guidelines made by drug users looks like, but they are also usable by doctors and for staff in uh, psychosocial care, because they are parts in it also um, for these topics. And so, um, I'm very um, um, happy that um, we have now a, a common version for for uh, all over Germany or for the for the three countries we have, and uh, uh, and we can use this version also for the Ger the special German situation with our special regulations that we bought both these things together. And what I heard from and drug user organization and also from drug services that they used this brochure, they gave it out to, um, to the people who want to read and use it. And uh, we have now, I think, 2000 copies um, for Germany and um, we have a distribution system that it comes in all, in all regions in Germany. And so I think it, it is a very important step that um, we, from the um, uh, from the perspective of people who use drugs and people in opioid substitution treatment, um, start a process to have guide OST guidelines and treatment guidelines, and but they are usable for all others too. And it is not only the perspective of people who use drugs, which is uh, inside um, these project. It is also the perspective. From, from doctors and from um, other people. And so it is very helpful, very useful and um, very important. And um, my the main goal and my wish is that we can um, um, have it also in some other European countries or in all European countries where drug user organizations are and that they can also work with. And um, we show in the three countries that it is possible to have European guidelines. They are usable in, spe in specific countries. And um, uh, I'm very happy to be part of the project and um, thanks a lot for your attention. Dirk, thank you for an excellent overview of what's happening in Germany in terms of the rollout. And I think you made some fantastic points there. Um, so I thought it was really good that you said that the first line use of this uh, document is for people who use opioids, but mm -hmm. you stressed the importance that it is usable for all kinds yeah. of disciplines uh, in terms of people who are providing treatment for people who use opioids, doctors and psychosocial care. Um, It got more than 2,000 copies printed, um, that it's been culturally adapted. And uh, I think yeah. that's one thing that the development team stressed. They recognize that's really, really important. Yeah. And that you've got a fabulous distribution uh, system by the, uh, mm -hmm. by, the, by the sound of it. So, I mean, well done. Thank you. In addition, if I can mention one thing, I think the, uh, the title of the project and also the leaflet is very important. OST, we are all in it. And with this, we show that not only we as people who use drugs and uh, would take OST are in it, but we are 
all in it with doctors and with uh, staff for psychosocial care and for other uh, disciplines. And I think that is, uh, we gave the hand to others to come with us to go the next step. And that's very important, I think. No, I think, I think I'm really pleased you said that, that message okay. of partnership yeah. and everybody needing to get behind the evidence yeah. and human rights based practice is a fantastic message for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. There were some, there were some comments and questions coming yeah. through as you were speaking. Um, so uh, people were immediately starting to ask about whether or not the leaflet is available in different languages. Mm -hmm. um, so there was uh, Mariana was saying we need this in Poland in our national language. The need here is huge. Uh, we also had An Antonino saying, "Is it in Italian? We also need it in, it in Italian." And Matthew were answering some of those questions, saying it's ready for translation. Do you want to say any more about that? So the whole setup of the project is that the leaflet has been designed by this uh, wonderful designer from Greece, and uh, and and uh, uh, designed a model that allows us to create this leaflet that folds down to an A5, but also opens up into having this big table where you can look at the different OST products. And uh, yeah, so so we have a toolkit, and it's uh, the aim is that this can be quickly translated and adapted to national contexts. Uh, the key for us is just having the funding to be able to roll out to this stage because this project has been developed with a 10,000 euro grant. So we're delighted that it's been creating such demand, but we are also slightly daunted um, in the funding that we have behind this project right now. That's, that's great. Thank you for that elaboration, Matt. That's really, really helpful. Uh, uh, Dirk, you were getting some great speech, Dirk, coming through on the comments there. Germany is one of the best OST systems, was also said. Um, Joe Schofield said, wonderful work. I'm sharing this with the Scottish Government's uh, Drug Death Task Force and their Medication Assisted Treatment Group. Congratulations to everybody involved. Uh, I've got a question from Lynn. Matt, would it print on A3 and you've got, yep, we can provide a print ready model. So we've got lots of excellent feedback coming through. So um, Dirk, thanks again for that. I think that was a great example of cultural adaptation and rollout and working in partnership. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, next on the agenda, we, uh, we wanted somebody to talk about the rollout in Sweden. Um, Matt, uh, did we get the speaker or are you going to uh, speak with this? Yeah, so let me just quickly cover the situation in Sweden. We're really delighted to have Sweden in this project. It's very easy to run projects on harm reduction and drug treatment, where we always work with countries like Germany or France that have really, really strong OST systems. However, for us, it was really important to also look at the spectrum of experience in Europe. And Sweden um, is a country that we know has some of the most restrictive opiate substitution therapy standards in Europe. As soon as you use on top, if you're caught using on top, you're thrown out of treatment. It's a very punitive and hostile environment. However, there is a group of uh, addiction doctors or uh, doctors specializing in drug misuse or drug, drug, sorry, drug dependence who um, are really key allies and are really working to improve the OST system in Sweden. And we are delighted to have had a conversation with them facilitated by the Swedish Drug Users Union, where we've started to talk about how can Euro input, the Swedish drug user groups and the Swedish Association of Addiction Professionals come together and create a, a resource that is useful in a Swedish context. Now, if you look at the, the main resource, we cover, I think five or six, depending on which country, different OST medications. In the UK, we've fought hard to make sure that all of those are described, even if they're not always available, because it supports our wider advocacy. However, in Sweden, we recognize starting to talk about dimorphine and long acting morphine would be a hostage to fortune in the, the advocacy negotiations. So we've agreed a more restricted list of buprenorphine and methadone. Um, 
And, and I think this process of tailoring to the national contract text is really important. Now, I don't want to overstate the partnership because we're still in negotiations. Uh, this is something that needs to be signed off by the wider society. Um, and we need that. That also includes proper negotiation about the content of the leaflet. So we're really excited and we're very grateful to Roberto Sandero from the uh, Swedish Drug User Union for being the key uh, leader on this piece of work. Uh, Matt, thank you very, very much for that explanation. Uh, and again, you reinforce some great points there about cultural adaptation and tailoring it to national context and being a, taking a very pragmatic approach about the kind of OST medication that you're talking about. So I thought that that was an excellent, excellent point. We've got some, some great stuff coming through in relation to the chat. Uh, we've got a comment coming through from Mariana saying, uh, the involvement of other stakeholders is absolutely critical and essential. Doctors, social workers, etc. We've got agreement coming through in relation to that, uh, and we've got and recognition of what is universal to all or to OST in all different countries. Um, we've got a statement: nothing about us without us, but with involvement of other stakeholders. I think that's a lovely. Uh, lovely kind of comment to make that uh, really uh, communicates the spirit of the work that's been undertaken. Uh, so that's fantastic. Uh, thank you very much indeed for all of those comments and keep them coming in. Uh, we will read them out as we go through. Okay, uh, next on the agenda, uh, we're gonna invite Lee, Lee Collingham to talk about uh, the experience of the rollout of the project in the UK. Lee, uh, welcome. And uh, Lee's looking extremely smart today. It's fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, before Lee. This start, before this started, I really liked a lot of you. But <laughs> since you've all spoke and gave amazing speeches, I hate you. You've said everything I was going to say. Anyway, for 20 years, I've been an advocate. I never knew about drug treatment before then. I did prison from the age of 11 till 32. And so I never knew about drug treatment. And then when I did and got to know it, I understood what was going wrong. Some people was being offered one sort of medication. And if you didn't have that, that was it. You didn't get treatment. Now, the other thing I noticed as well was a lot of friends were dying. And excuse me. And I had to do something about that. Now, the only way I could think of doing anything meaningful as a single person is from the inside. So I started working with the local crime and drug partnership and the health shop, because I've always been a firm believer when money's tight, partnership working is when the most effective and best projects happen. When everybody's working together for the same objective, that's when the best um, projects happen. And this information leaflet we've done, I think does that because First of all, the name, we are all in it together. Whether you're a prescriber, you're a patient, or you're a drug worker. And by everyone working together, it makes for a better working relationship, and it also makes for a better working environment. Because stats say that 60% of drug workers will take time off for sickness because of stress. Now, we don't want to give them another time. As OST clients, all we want to be is not ill. We don't want to be dictated to. We don't want to be sanctioned because we've missed his medication once. Now, the project started out as three different countries, Sweden, Germany, and the UK. However, Matt and I quickly realized that the UK is four countries, and each one of them is very, very different. For instance, in Northern Ireland, there's a lot of history, and it's time-limited treatment. Thankfully, for the first 10 years I was doing advocacy, we had the NTA. And when we had them, everyone moaned about them. And since we've gone in and we've got a conservative government and we've had the uh, recovery model, it's only thanks to people like Matt, myself, like Annette in the UK, and a few others like Erin, that on reduction and the lockdown is still on the agenda. And now, thankfully, there's going to be a number of campaigns coming out that should have happened 10 years ago. We're actually doing work now 
that we did 10 years ago, we were repeating ourselves because doctors want to have control. Now, the whole point of this leaflet is to make service users aware of what's available to them and not give them unrealistic expectations, like saying, right, everyone's going to get dimorphine, because that's very unlikely. However, you're also going to get stuff like OSD. The latest one now is Bivadol, the long acting, take it for months you don't use on top. Well, not everybody has abstinence as a goal. I certainly don't. So anything that they're going to give me, especially something like naltrexone, they, they're actually doing harm to me. But what I found by having those conversations, I've got the changes that I've needed. It's took a long time, but like us, a lot of drug workers and commissioners are human, but their objectives are, is money. My objective is if keeping people alive because I'm doing work on um, do not attend at the minute. And one thing I do know is dead people don't attend appointments. Now, luckily, we've had to take it slowly throughout the four countries. In the UK, we've always had quite a forward thinking group of organisations and there's a number come on board, quite rightly so, because the leaflet, it does what it says on the tin and it gives realistic advice. And if everyone sang from the same song sheet, there'd be a lot less problems for everybody. So a lot of organisations in England have recognised that. Because of the politics in Ireland, I've reached out to a few people and it's taken a bit longer, obviously. In Scotland, we've, we've had some amazing talks. And because of that, like you mentioned earlier, and that about their drug-related task force, they've done some amazing work in the last 12, 18 months that actually stand a chance of drug-related deaths in Scotland not being a record high this year. And thankfully, what has been happening, because it's election time, everyone's been getting behind Peter Kuykamp. I know it's sort of changed from what he's doing, but all of a sudden, he couldn't get insurance for his van because he didn't want it on the road because he was providing a lock zone and a consumption room. And then all of a sudden, Nicholas Sturgeon wants to meet with him. So, yeah, um, they're well on board, but obviously their system's different to England. So the bastards, and we've said, yes, we'll make the changes, but it's as a partnership. We've done a lot of work on this document and we want to share it as far and wide as we can. But we also want to be part of any development of it. We don't want people to hijack it and do it for their own objectives. Because at the end of the day, a lot of us that have done it, have done it because we want better treatment for ourselves. We don't want to make money out of it. We don't want no awards. We don't want anything special. All we want is to be trapped with equality. And that's it. And um, yeah, that's as far as, as much as I've got to say without repeating what everyone else has said, I'm afraid. Uh, Lee, um, that's a fantastic um, overview that you've given there. And also uh, sharing your personal experience there. We've got some very positive comments coming through the chat. Uh, uh, Luana, great, great sharing, Lee, regards from Portugal. Um, there's, uh, you've, you've really mentioned uh, and brought home and reminded everybody of the importance of um, uh, the issue of uh, drug-related deaths and opioid-related deaths. As we know, this is ec increasing exp exponentially in many parts of the world. Um, and you shared your personal experience about losing uh, friends. Um, and it, it, It's been a, big, a good quarter. I've only lost 10 since December. Gosh, gosh, I know. And we know, I mean... That's the world we live in, though, and that. It is, the, it, is the world that, it is the world that we live in. And, um, yeah, no, absolutely. And sadly, we know that up to half of people who... Um, become dependent on opiates, die of, of overdose and uh, drug-related illnesses, and yeah. our lives that can be saved. Um, oh. we, 
you've got a reminder from let me just uh from sergio uh when we opened the webinar we should have mentioned the loss of our different dear friends who've left and who must remain in our thoughts peace to our oh. soul i think yeah. many of us have lost friends and family members to overdose i know i certainly have it's and it's and it's a tragedy, and particularly where we can uh, prevent these things. Um, it's great to hear your testimony in terms of uh, Scotland and the fantastic reception that the project has had up there, and uh, particularly how well it's gone down with the uh, Drug-Related Death Task Force. Uh, yeah. As we know, was in dire straits, uh, is still in dire straits around this. But if you can do anything to help them turn it around, that's fantastic. Um, the other couple of things that I thought I'd mention that you Scotland's two, so five. <laughs> oh, and Ireland's two, so six. <laughs> absolutely. So we've got, yeah, absolutely. But it felt very much from the heart as well. No words. It was a privilege to be invited along to um, take part. Oh, that's that's fantastic. And we've got uh, another, we've got a comment, well presented Lee, uh, Euro NPUD is delighted that Duncan Hill and Professor Katrina Matheson have championed the resource in Scotland. The next stage is a consultation with the Scottish people on opioid dependence, and we're hoping a co-branded tailored version will appear in Scotland. Um, so we've got some great uh, comments coming through there. So, and keep your comments coming through. Uh, and, and thank you for the reminder. I mean, the, um, the OST guidance, we are in it together. It does cover opioid substitution treatment, but it absolutely and rightly also covers responding to opioid overdose and naloxone, the life-saving uh, medication that uh, we need to get spread in every community, in every country uh, in the world, if we can, and we're a way off there. Um, Okay, thank you very, very much indeed for that. Um, I'd now like to invite um, our final speaker, uh, Dr. Christos K, um, who's uh, the Greek uh, National Drug Treatment Coordinator part-time and who also works in OST treatment in the UK to have some, provide some reflection <coughs> on the project after having heard from all of our speakers and uh, their experiences. Uh, so, uh over to you. Thank you, thank you, Annette. Uh, I think you have already summarized and reflected quite extensively of what we have heard. Um, but uh, I would like to uh, approach what I've heard from my relatively new position as the of how important is our policies and approaches to be based on evidence, scientific evidence. And, and, and this is really, really important because the history of uh, uh, treatment for addictions, either drugs or behavioral addictions, is full of uh, philosophical, religious, uh, other social uh, approaches, uh, and, and sometimes uh, people approach the whole thing starting with, I believe, I think, rather than that's what we know so far, this is where the evidence could take us, these are the pros and cons of whatever decision we're, make, we're going to make at any level. And it's very important to say that uh, the agenda in different countries 
has uh, progressed in different uh, directions. So for example, in the UK, uh, people who are using services are involved in research projects. In other countries, they are totally excluded. It, can, it is a very novel idea or threatening idea that people are involved in uh, developing evidence. Um, whatever we don't have that is very important for people who are using the services to be involved in implementation of evidence which have been generated in a foreign country, in another country, or uh, in, uh, uh, in their own country. Uh, it is very important to keep in mind also that we need to follow the principle of a balance between uh, demand reduction and supply reduction policy. And that is crucial uh, for countries outside, the, outside Europe, uh, where this balance has been achieved to a better or lesser uh, level. Um, and that's why, as you know, EU always stands to meet, as you all said, their aims and objectives at a particular uh, time of their lives. Knowledge for professionals is also very important because professionals are not necessarily trained uh, into uh, the problem substance we use. Um, even when I was a young uh, professional in the UK, uh, the average amount of time that doctors or psychiatrists uh, had on substance use or addiction was very minimum. Things have been improved since then. In other countries like Greece, the exposure, the training that health professionals, doctors, nurses, social workers they have on addiction is almost next to zero. And these people, these colleagues, these professionals need to implement and care for people without having the appropriate training. And lack of training creates defensive practices. Uh, but also knowledge shared with the people, with the population, with the communities out there will help uh, for people to move away from dilemmas or um, polarized approaches into the uh, social challenge of uh, drug use. The third point, which your project is addressing is the balance of power. Balance of power between professionals and people who are using drugs, between professionals and policymakers. Uh, and this balance of power is critical. It's critical because uh, none of those groups know everything. So collaboration is crucial. Uh, to improve the quality of treatment provided, the effectiveness of treatment, the uh, uh, improvement of public health or the positive impact of, impact of treatment provided or policy developed uh, for the uh, well being of the society as a whole. I'm a clinician and I will just make a note about clinicians. Whenever there is, a, in whatever country, and my experience comes from the UK and Greece, there isn't a protective framework for professionals to practice uh, and provide treatment, those clinicians become very defensive. Uh, because we need to find a balance between the rights that a service user has and people who are using services have by de facto because about their life, but also the risks that uh, professionals take within a specific legal framework to provide treatment. And we need to always keep that in mind because it's something that I face day in, day out, both in, uh, in Greece as a policymaker,
discussion as a practical tourism. Point four, you said it's already, you emphasized it, adaptation of this excellent uh, information flyer to the legal system and the framework of each country is of paramount importance. It's, on, from one hand, the uh, scientific evidence might be global and international, the implementation of this evidence needs to be uh, specific to each country. Uh, otherwise, is not going to be uh, acceptable. It is also important to distribute that uh, knowledge, to empower the knowledge of professionals, as I said, and Germany has done really well into that, but also a vulnerable group of clients out there, of people out there, uh, homeless people who don't know uh, which direction to go and they have preconceived ideas of what treatment might be and so forth, so forth. And I'm talking about that because the, the major challenge I have as a policymaker in this is that how to uh, approach the, the, the major issue of homelessness and uh, uh, drug use in the center of the two big cities. And don't forget, don't fall, we shouldn't fall into uh, the trap of divide and rule. And unfortunately, this is the trap we all follow fall into very easily. It's very easy to divide between professionals and people who are using services. Very easy to divide between the local community and the people who live on the streets. It's very easy to divide between uh, uh, different uh, approaches, scientific approaches into drug treatment. Let's avoid this uh, trap and let's all be together into developing and implementing quality treatment approaches uh, in each one of the countries for the benefit of the bigger society, of the service users and their, their families, people using services and their families. Uh, thank you, that was all I had to say. Christos, that was fantastic. Thank you very, very much for those insights. Um, so you made four key points and then a very important one at the end, I think. Um, one was around policies based on evidence based uh, practice, uh, uh, sorry, policies based on scientific evidence. And I, uh, that I, I totally second that and I wish that more countries, uh, more countries abided by that. I think it's something that we all need to champion. Uh, you talked about uh, uh, professionals training and doctors not being trained. And that's an important thing that we need to get right. You made a really important point, I think, about the balance of power uh, in terms of the patient, uh, patient service user, uh, client and the clinician and spoke as a clinician, which I thought was really interesting and talked about the balance between service users' rights and then professionals and the risks that they take. And there was a very interesting comment in the chat as you were talking about that, about, you know, sometimes that we, we need the trust and we need the partnership there. That was coming through in the comments that I thought was really insightful. Uh, you talked about the need for cultural adaptation so that the guidance is specific to every country. So otherwise it's not acceptable. And then um, your final point, I think was a fabulous one, which was, you know, we all need to be in this together for the greater good of society, uh, essentially, you know, because if we work together, put aside individual differences or perspectives or whatever, we come out with something better together. Uh, so thank you very, very much for that presentation. We've got lots of thank yous coming through on the chat. Thank you, dear Dr. K, pointing out all that we so often struggle with. Very good insights, Christos, thank you. We've got con congratulations to all the presenters. Um, very important, Dr. Christos, to see the central role of effective therapeutic alliances in driving change. Um, thank you, Dr. Christos, you're writing History in Greece. It's the first time the national coordinator is looking and discussing with the community. There was another comment that came through earlier, congrats to Greek peers for an open-minded country drug coordinator. 
Um, so we've got some uh, really interesting things coming through. We did have a comment on uh, from uh, about from, from a, a, a fellow um, Greek, which is we need to address diversion in Greece too. It's uh, defaming OST here. I, you may want to comment in relation to that. Give me a second. Sorry, give me a second to unmute. Okay, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, thank you. So the, the yes. comment was, we need to address diversion in Greece too. Maybe, maybe I had a comment on diversion. We, we've, we've done some work on looking at diversion patterns and I think it's very important to understand the different types of diversion. Sometimes it's very benign where drug users are actually drawing people into treatment by sharing their medication. And many of us experienced OST for the first time in that way. Now, we need to be careful not to exclude that from the system, but we also don't want people to give away medication that is very useful to them. But most of us learn quickly to build up some reserve just to keep us protected. It, it, the sale it, of medication is much more challenging and that undermines the OST system. We've seen in Macedonia where everybody's selling their methadone outside the clinic, dramatically drives down the credibility of the system. So we see OST literacy and rights is about building an alliance together to make sure medication is effectively used. And if you have good access to OST, then diversion doesn't need to follow. That's yeah. the key. Yeah. I think this is a critical point, Matt. You have good access, there's no need for diversion. Diversion develops whenever people don't have access to what they need. They, they Then the challenge is that, um, Wherever there is a, a narrative that, that uh, uh, opioid prescribing is a continuation of the drug culture, and wherever there are such polarized views, unfortunately, against uh, opioid substitution treatment, uh, there is a shared responsibility of both professionals, policymakers, and people using the substances to defend that and help the rest of the society understand that. Uh, being on methadone or buprenorphine, whatever open substitution treatment, is not the same as using drugs. There is a huge difference. That's why we need to avoid terms drugs when we refer to medications. Uh, it's semantics sometimes are crucial to change attitudes. Um, and I say that because last night for five hours I was in a, in a, in a community meeting about the homelessness problem of Athens and people living out there, the, the local, uh, people were referring to people using drugs as drug addicts, junkies, this, the other, in a such stigmatizing language that obviously uh, had to do with the stigmatizing approach into the whole thing, take them away, make them disappear, we don't want them here. Uh, and and uh, sometimes it's, bad. it's easier to change the language we use ourselves first, in this unequal struggle in society for our rights and dignity as persons together we are stronger and no one knows better than us what we've been through in terms of stigma and discrimination so our community is a community of warriors and i think we've all got a responsibility to try and tackle this stigma and discrimination and the language that we use and then and also how we we talk about, uh, very importantly, how we talk about OST medication as medication, it's medication. It's essential medication in many. Uh, we have another couple of questions that came through that I'd be interested in terms of the, uh, 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 the panel's response on. So we've got one uh, from a uh, contributor from the Ukraine who, who was at saying, described a uh, what sounded like a non-evidence-based prescribing regime and asked a question, how do I raise doctor awareness uh, in terms of um, uh, the prescribing in terms of OST? So a really interesting uh, point there. Um, and then also another comment that came through, which I thought was interesting, which was, how can we use some of the positive changes 
that have come from the impact of COVID-19, uh, where in some countries there's been a move to more flexible, supervised consumption, less, uh, less urine testing and more flexibility of services. So uh, there's a couple of couple of questions there. Uh, uh, Christos, can I invite you first to make any comment on, on those? Christos K, me. Christos K. Yeah. Uh, again, I would approach the question about COVID. Uh, again, we need to look into the balance and we need to know what we have experienced. If by any way, the diversion of our medication would be linked to the overdoses and the deaths we have seen, that would be a big blow against OST. If we say that, and we are establishing that lack of access to treatment because of the restrictions of the COVID and so forth, that would be a big win uh, for, for OST. Uh, from experience, because I was involved in global surveys and we've done smaller projects in Greece, Sometimes whatever service we use does not capture the real problem. And I will say that the major problem in Greece, as I think it happened in other countries, is that COVID exposed the weaknesses of whatever treatment system was there before the COVID. And for example, the major problem that most of the countries had for our people in treatment had that their access to physical treatment for HIV hepatitis C or any other medical condition has been really reduced to next to zero. And we're talking here about very, very vulnerable population out there to the point that there were certain people in Greece that they were on HIV treatment that were not able to access because all the doctors were diverted from the HIV services to staff COVID uh, services. Uh, so, uh, And over to users, um, COVID hospitals and all of the, the people that were there as patients actually uh, uh, had to leave. Um, so there's been some very interesting responses. Can I bring, Dirk, can I bring you in yeah. on this one in terms of COVID? Um, yes, um, just a second, my camera, yeah. Um, I know that uh, COVID got um, very bad outcomes for people who use drugs and, but what we see in Germany is uh, that we um, have a strong increase of patient numbers um, during the COVID crisis because um, the German government with support also of um, uh, drug use organizations, uh, patient organizations and um, uh, the doctors organizations um, made last year in, in April some very important changes of the law in Germany. And um, that's got um, in June last year more than 2,300 people uh, from the street get into opiate substitution treatment. Also people without health insurance. This is possible during the COVID crisis. And the major goal for us and what we try to do is that these conditions um, which show that they are helpful and um, they are safe, that um, uh, we keep on going like this after the COVID crisis and we can implement that 
in the narcotic law in Germany that this is also possible after the COVID crisis. And um, yeah, um, I know that COVID external control measures regarding OST in Germany or other countries, uh, meaning respecting patients' rights. And she makes a comment that patients' rights in Poland are commonly undermined. Yeah, it, uh, patients' rights are not in the top of the list in Germany, as, as I can say it uh, this way. We have a very um, much, uh, many examples that um, the relationship between patients and doctors is not very good. They cannot choose their substance they want to use and uh, many different things. But what we did in Germany, we tried to implement uh, a kind of contract. All people in Germany who are in OST treatment must sign a contract with their doctor with some re regulations and something like that. And um, we work on a, um, on, a con on a modern contract also with, uh, in the view of people who use drugs. And we try to implement this new contract in the relationship between doctors and patients. It worked, but not all over Germany, only in some regions and some cities. But this could be, could be a way to, to implement uh, 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 things like that. Also, our project here is a step forward for patients' rights in OST treatment. And, um, but this, uh, the situation is not good also in Germany, but we work on that, that uh, it will be better in the future. Yeah. Uh, thank you very, very much for that insight, uh, Dirk. That's, that's really interesting to hear about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got comments coming through, uh, go Germany. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we try. <laughs> absolutely. We've got some. Uh, we've got something that says similar in in I think Nottinghamshire. Uh, it took lockdown. Uh, we've got a comment. Services must be open all day long. Uh, no, uh, it was my mistake. Poor typing. Until lockdown one ended, where uh, it was ours. Everybody. It all ended then, and it's gone back to normal now. But. Uh, community protection officers and police officers carry it, so it's a move forward. Yes, so thank you for thank you for sharing that, Lee. So yeah, no, the community protection officers uh, carrying the locks on is a come into treatment because actually not having to come every day has been seen as accessible. I know in my area, one disabled drug user has come into treatment, one agrophobic drug user has come into treatment, all driven by the fears of you know, being caught without drugs during lockdown. However, in the break between the two lockdowns in the UK, we saw a worrying trend of drug workers starting to pull people back. to defend take home doses if we start to see pushback. So um, yeah, please come and join us in that piece of work. And if your country would like the resource, please let us know. On, on that Matt, is there any, is there any chance of sort of like including other advocacy organizations? 
Because in the UK, there is no independent advocacy. You complain yeah. to the drug service, they cover for everybody, and they usually get nothing. Yeah, so one of the things yeah. we've found a lot in the UK is that we rarely get acknowledgement of problems. We often get change, but where we force it and it's seen as exceptional rather than as routine. So one thing that Release has very successfully done is they fought a case in the UK for a group of drug users who were on diamorphine. The treatment providers were trying to take it away largely on the basis of cost, not on the basis of personal need. Release fought the case. It was, it was actually settled out of court because court, they realised they were going to lose. Bearings have now given more money to Release to share that learning. And uh, Kirsty is writing, uh, Kirsty Dowse is right from Release is writing an advocacy brief that will help UK drug user advocates defend people in OST. So that's a core resource. Chris Hallam is leading on that for Euroempud. Again, it's a UK funded project, but again, any parts of this that can be adapted and translated, that's the whole purpose of how Euroempud works. That's fantastic, Matt. Thank you very, very much for sharing that. Um, it might be worth also looking at the, the uh, American Association for the Treatment of Opioid Dependence were asked to do a survey uh, to look at the uh, changes in some of the relaxation around uh, super, supervision largely and uh, increasing take home doses in the States. And surprise, surprise, the world didn't fall in when they did this and um, actually made people's quality of life better. And I know that uh, ATOD, as it's called, uh, the chair of that has been championing to keep that relaxation in place there. So I think that there's, a, there's some movement happening over the water and that's in a country where, of course, we know it's very uh, litigious and, and uh, doctors are risk averse because of the risk of legal action, etc. Uh, I just wanted to also mention that uh, in the chat, uh, Matt put up a blog post uh, written uh, by Euro Enpud for the UK's biggest treatment provider, and that's Change Grow Live, CGL. Uh, and Tony Lee and Matt were invited to present the work to all the prescribers in uh, CGL and offered support to the project. I think we might have uh, Mark I work in Kazakhstan on occasion and I know the situ situation there needs to improve uh, a lot in terms of OSD services. Um, let's see what else we've got coming through. We've got a comment from Lynn Jeffries. Uh, UISCE stroke Ireland would be interested in a resource on takeaways for sure. Uh, so uh, that's great. Um, and we've got, what else have we got coming through? Okay, so I think that's about it in terms of the comments. Let me just check the Q&A. Um, so we've still got the outstanding uh, question from our, our dear friend in the Ukraine who's on um, OST and who wanted to uh, share ideas, wanted ideas on how to uh, increase doctor's awareness. Uh, any of the panel like to issues where we needed to talk to pharmacists about how to manage these issues um, because obviously it caused issues but even at the highest level we're now seeing problems with the quality of different OSTs in different countries and again that's why we need to be talking to Unitaid it's why we need to be engaging with different medicines authorities I think we've started to understand as drug user rights networks that we have to be engaged from the ground right through to the highest level procurement and policy making if Thank uh you. -huh. 
Okay. Um, okay, so we're, we're now uh, kind of, if there's, if there's any more questions, we've got, uh, we've got a little bit of time. Uh, or if we're coming to a natural end, we're also happy to uh, to finish the uh, webinar. We've got many people needing to go on to different things. So Dirk is leaving us. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution, Dirk. Uh, he says hugs from Germany to us all. Hugs back, Dirk. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. You were great. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you all very the best much. to you. That's that's great. Thank you, Dirk. You was great. You're wonderful. Thanks. So, so maybe just one last thing in there, just to say that if, if there are countries out there that see any of the resources coming out of this project as being useful to you, please reach out to Christos as the project manager. We, we would need to put funding together to back this, but a lot of the big funding has already been done. So the translation and rollout, we think there are partners who can support us with that working country. So please come and support, talk to Christos and we can find how to use this uh, project more effectively, uh, find out how to use this resource to maximize the rights and health of people with opiate dependence. That's great. Thank you, Matt. Great. I was just going to say, we've got a comment from uh, Mark from CGL saying, uh, thanks for the mention. We're collaborating on an ongoing basis. Our own Pulse surveys demonstrated that choices and options are really key in the ongoing provision of uh, see you again and congratulations hugs goodbyes greetings from tanzania thank you mm. that's amazing thanks and greetings from denmark so we've had people from all over so um uh participants presenters uh, anybody that's just listened or dropped in uh thank you very very much for uh listening to us thank you for your comments uh, thank you for um, uh, any any uh, any further comments that you want to make. Uh, I think this is a really important project. I think the series of webinars uh, will be um, uh, informative and involve lots of people. So thank you very much to Matt and Euro Enput uh, to organising all of this. Uh, thank you to Christos. A, thank you to Lee, thank you uh, to uh, Roberto behind the scenes for helping sort everything out, without whom none of this would have been possible. And, yes, great uh, help from Roberto. Thank you, Roberto, very much indeed. So I think that we're just about done. So uh, panel, yeah. members, would you like to say any final words or say goodbye to anybody? Christos? Don't forget uh, to subscribe to the next uh, webinar. There are three more, it's uh, every... Uh, the same day of the week, the same time, and then uh, su subscribe. We have a wonderful talk uh, with all together. Thank you very, very much indeed. Lee, any last words from you? Carry a kit and save a life. We can see that. That's great. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I carry that message anyway and everywhere. People get sick of me talking about in the lockdown, but no, amazing that so many people from wide around came and, and joined us for, I think it's a very important piece of work that should be out there for everyone to read from, you know what I mean? To at least understand if they don't know how to sort it, they can get in touch with someone. So it's the start of a long road, I think. Well said, Lee, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you for your, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Matt, no final words from you. Yeah, just to acknowledge, thank you, Christos, for doing all the hard work that put this event together. Roberto, thank you for your behind the scenes support, much appreciated. The Euro Input Correlation Partnership.